afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 edition of our series, FinTech Fridays, brought to you by BDO Australia. My name is Tim Ammon. I'm BDO's global leader, global FinTech leader, as, the, as well as the national financial services leader. Today, we are diving into the world of wealth tech and wealth and asset management. Before we kick things off, I would just like to quickly draw your attention to the housekeeping slide that is currently showing on your screen. To start, you are all automatically muted, but we'll be accepting questions throughout the session, and you can submit these using the question tab. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. However, if we cannot respond to your question, we'll follow up with you after the webinar concludes. <clears throat> if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click the support button, which is one of the bottom tabs on your screen. And finally, if this session is being recorded and all registrants will receive a follow-up email containing the slides, a link to the recording, access to register for future sessions, and a speaker contact, contact details for all of us. In the realm of Australian FinTech, Wealth tech is emerging when compared to the more mature fintech peers, notably someone like payments. However, it has exploded in Australia and the globe over the past few years, particularly during COVID-19 as the commuter, consumer demands have been changing. Wealth tech companies are challenging traditional models and changing the way retail and institutional investors manage wealth. Incumbents are now having to relook at the way they deliver advice with technology. Today, to discuss wealth tech, I am pleased to welcome Chris Brickey, founder and CEO of Stockspot. Stockspot is Australia's first and largest digital investment advisor or robo-advisor. Founded in 2013 with a mission to help more Australians access expert investment advice and portfolio management. Stockspot has also been shortlisted in FinTech Australia's The Finneys for the Excellence in Wealth Management Award. I'm also pleased to welcome James Dixon, partner audit and assurance based in our Melbourne office. He has been working in professional services for over 20 years with a focus on financial services. He also has a, a broader financial services consulting experience with specific skills relating to merger due diligence, APRA comprehensive reviews, and AML CDF independent reviews, to name a few. Welcome both and happy Friday. Thanks, Tim. Um, to begin with, let's start by defining wealth tech. What does it cover and what are the business models that are emerging? One of the things that sort of changed from uh, the last FinTech Fridays is, is, is now we have access to some additional data. So then uh, for those that I've been talking with who have been trying to get a, a license with CB Insights, so this is the first time we're going to be weaving in some CB Insights maps and information. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that and those will be sent around you know, after, after the session. Um, as you can see on the screen, this is, these are some of the things that define what wealth tech is. It's a diverse segment covering a full range of software and platforms, such as full service brokerage platforms, automated robo advisors, self service investment platforms, asset class specific marketplaces, and tools for both individual investors and advisors to navigate the changes in wealth management in the wealth management industry. Chris, the two main categories of wealth tech include B2B and B2C, but we also seen B2B to C or business to business to, cons to cons customer. Can you explain further these business models we see here on the slide and, and how have you seen these been? Uh, yeah, sure, Tim. So, I mean, wealth tech is, I think people should probably understand, first of all, a subset of fintech. So, you know, fintech includes other areas like payments and, and cryptocurrency. Wealth tech's a, a small um, subset of, of that, and like you say, in Australia, it's, it's probably a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um, the, the different categories that we sort of see in Australia on the direct-to-consumer side um, are, are, are business models like micro savings and micro investing, uh, robo advisors, um, like social trading, stock trading, crypto trading, different stock analysis tools. Um, even comparison sites to some extent, and, and retirement tools. So they're generally um, different technology services that help uh, the end consumer manage their money and manage their wealth. Um, and then on the B2B side, uh, I mean, B2B fintech probably existed for a little longer um, because I would consider a lot of the technology that's used to serve financial advisors in Australia to be um, B2B uh, fintech. So the big platforms like the irises and, and the Hub 24s and the um, NetWealths, I mean, these are all essentially fintechs but b2b fintechs because they're serving a, an advisor um, and then there's different fintechs that are sort of a, a mishmash of the two of these where um, they uh, yeah they, they serve um, yeah a, a group of people that then serve the end customers 
Um, so in, in other markets, particularly robo advisors are now offering, for instance, white label um, offerings in order to um, allow advisors to um, provide a scaled service to their clients. It's kind of interesting because you mentioned some names like the irises and hub 24s and, and I think it's quite interesting because they probably wouldn't traditionally see themselves as a fintech you know but now in the emerging world of where we are now they were kind of sort of pioneers to get into this particular space so you know it's quite interesting when we look at wealth tech um, you know it's it's a blurring of a few other sort of fintech sort of subsectors but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit as we go um, James, um, I guess in terms of what players are there in Australia and what changes have you been seeing in the wealth management landscape here? If we touch on the, the changes in the wealth management landscape first, probably, Tim. Uh, I mean, it's always it's always evolving. It's a very diverse and, and multifaceted sector at the moment. You've got the the continued demise of the of the vertical integration. So we've obviously seen MLC leave leave the NAB. We've seen Colonial leave CBA. There's there's talk of BT and Westpac now. So there's there's constantly movements in that front and and the increase of private equity in that regard. I mean we're we're always seeing always seeing foreign investment managers looking to come into the market. Although obviously that's died down a bit with the with the pandemic and and life being more difficult in general. Uh, the continued increase in, in regulation and, and increased societal scrutiny, I mean, particularly in the superannuation industry, it's driving consolidation, uh, changes in operating structures, and, and so it's leaving leaving a massive massive opportunity there for for new entrant, new entrants and, and alternative providers. Uh, so for the wealth tech and the fintech to really really take hold with increasing technology, uh, moving away from a from a face-to-face -face approach to, to much more of a much more of an online transacting model, and uh, and you can pick it up and do it do it whenever you want. Uh, there's a there's a wide range on the slide of, of entities that you that we've listed on there, and they're they're a very good very good example of uh, of entries and market participants in Australia, uh, and we're seeing them seeing them really attack the the traditional areas. Like if you think about superannuation, for example, there's there's new platforms and new fintechs coming in all the time and looking to build their own funds and to, to really target that that latent market that exists. Yeah, so Dan, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the changing demographics in terms of wealth and wealth transfer a, a little bit later, but I think it's, you know, it, it's kind of interesting in terms of, um, you know, we, we're just starting to see the growth of fintechs in general, you know, so in terms of you know, Stone and Chalk, which is right across the street from me, they've got about 400 sort of fintechs. Fishburner has a few hundred fintechs. So one thing that's that's great about Australia is is sort of a, a real fintech uh, incubator, and and we're starting to to get some real recognition. You know, I saw in the Fin Review this morning, you know, the CEO of Apple was you know uh, calling out how well the apps are being developed on here in Australia, and obviously we saw the big transaction, you know, last week with with sort of Afterpay. So I think. The sector itself is doing doing fantastic. Um, maybe we'll move to. I guess one of the one of the cool things about the, this license that we have is the next slide is this global market map. And so again, you know, we'll send this out, but you know, it it, it sort of breaks down uh, some of the key players that we're starting to see in the different types of of wealth tech. Um, and you know, the good part is obviously, you know, we're hoping to have more and more Australian companies sort of, you know, add to this list as as they start to become global. So one of the things with, that we could, you know, typically talk about a couple times a year on, on sort of fintech Fridays is, is, you know, looking at the expansion of Australian talent, you know, heading over heading overseas, and hopefully from a from a wealth tech perspective, we're going to start to see a few people uh, get themselves embedded overseas. And and probably one thing that I'd like to see a lot of my clients are starting to expand overseas, either with small ventures kind of overseas in, in Europe. Um, it's quite interesting in terms of whether or not they go to Europe or whether or not they pick the US. Typically, those are probably the two main places that they're looking to go to. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, from a wealth tech global perspective, Chris, you know, what trends have you been seeing? Have, you know, in terms of from an Australian perspective, are you starting to see uh, some of your peers, you know, think about going global, starting to, to act more global? 
and in and now you've seen some of these you know fintechs wealth tech companies starting to to come down to australia well i'd say i mean the broader the broadest trend tim that's been happening probably for the last 10 is is like an unbundling i'd say of of wealth services that used to be housed within um, you know, big financial organisations, asset managers or, or banks, um, you know, whether it's the trading pieces or the asset management pieces or retirement planning or, or James mentioned superannuation. What we're seeing is a whole bunch of um, new entrants basically focusing on one of these and trying to do one, one thing really, really well and, and build an audience and a loyal customer base in that one area. Um, and that's been happening yeah, definitely in Europe and North America and, and to uh, probably a lesser extent here in Australia. Now what's starting to happen in North America and Europe is uh, a re-aggregation. So you start to see some of these incumbents, um, you know, buying fintechs and even wealth techs um, because they see the value in what they're doing and, and they, they realised one way or another that it's quite hard to build, build that themselves. Um, good example recently was JP Morgan in, um, in the UK just bought Nutmeg, which was the largest robo-advisor over there. Um, so that, that um, re-aggregation I think is just starting overseas and it's going to take a few years probably to happen in Australia. Um, I, I think WellTech's an interesting one where um, in other areas probably like payments or lending, you know, Afterpay is a good example where there are Aussie businesses that have been able to take their um, services globally and, and succeed globally. WealthTech, um, even some of the best funded wealth tech businesses, and I mean, I'm looking at our category of, of robo advice in the US and Europe, have really struggled to expand into other markets. Um, good example would be Wealth Simple, which is the largest robo advisor in Canada. Um, now, they're definitely not short any capital. They just raised $750 million a few months ago, um, but they launched out of Canada into the UK and the US, and both of those businesses now they've shut down. Um, because competition is so stiff, you know, they struggle to build a brand there, you know, their regulatory and demographic differences that are, are difficult to kind of understand and overcome. So there does seem to be, you know, more geographical barriers to setting up um, at least B2C wealth tech businesses in other markets. That's probably very different in, in um, B2B to C or, or B2B businesses where particular you know, reg tech appliances here may may work in other markets or, you know, if you're servicing, let's say, fund managers or hedge funds, you, you know, it's probably global, globally applicable. Um, but, yeah, the, definitely the nuances of um, retail investors is, is different enough in different markets where um, there seems to have been sort of quite quite a, a geographical separation between services. So you see, you know, the biggest robo-advisor in Japan doesn't exist in other markets. The biggest robo-advisor in Germany is really only in Germany and Austria and Switzerland. The biggest one in Italy is only in Italy. The biggest one in the UK is only there. Um, it's an interesting, I guess, sub-dynamic is that these, um, you know, wealth tech, consumer wealth tech businesses haven't really gone global. Yeah, and, and I guess in, in it is, that kind of makes some sense just in terms of some of the regulatory burdens and I think in terms of which then links a little bit with tax, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of some of the, the, the tax requirements. I think, you know, for someone, you know, I think we're looking for a global wealth tax, you know, I, you know, we've been talking with crypto people who can do tax, tax returns, you know, across all the different geographies, et cetera. So I think it, it will happen, but I think, you know, it's kind of funny how you mentioned, you know, the German robo-advisor, Clearly sticking to the language that they that they speak, you know, in terms of you know Swiss in Austria. So um, it could just be a mini dynamic in terms of the wealth tech space, um, you know, because I think we've seen other parts of the fintech market look to reach out to come over to to Australia. You know, if you look at the personal finance, you know, part of it, you're seeing a lot more people that are looking to come sort of cross border. So. You know, and again, I think, you know, we've talked before a little bit about open banking, open finance, you know, it probably depends on when things are more accessible, you know, remotely in terms of open API. So it's good good to kind of watch this space. Um, let's just take a little bit of a, a little bit of a look in terms of how we kind of got there or where we are now uh, and talk a little bit about a funding. Um, you know, and, and Chris, I'll ask you a specific question in a minute, but we'll just run through a few a few sort of graphs in terms of some historical numbers. If we look at funding, it tells the story of wealth tech's emergence in Australia over the past five years. You can see the wealth tech funding is on the rise. Um, you can see 29, almost about 30 million was raised across three deals, and that was about 146% increase in funding in the previous year. Uh, and you can see Q1 21 funding 
was was moving quite well in terms of uh, pre-COVID. We can also see that funding over the last five years or so was at its lowest in 2019 and spiked in 2020. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the factors driving it, but it will link a little bit with COVID, which is obviously very topical in both Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne and across Australia and, and the Royal Commission. And James, I'll talk to you a little bit specifically about some Royal Commission points. When we look at the, you know, if, again, I work with a lot of um, startup sort of fintechs, and, and one of the, the key focus areas is the type of funding that they're looking to try to get. And you can see probably in 2016, it was all seed and angel funding. And now, and now you can sort of see that the, the market is maturing and we're into the mid-stage deal. Um, and so particularly over the past year, uh, it made up over 67% of all, all deals, and it was relatively quiet in 2019. Um, and you can see that seed seed funding fell to about 33% of all deals in 2020. Uh, and this is kind of kind of consistent with what we're kind of seeing globally. Uh, we're starting to see that there's a, a downward trend in the number of deals that were peaking in 2018, but you can see the deal value continues to go. Um, and then if you look at maturity of the funding levels, you can see it's starting to, to get raised across all funding levels. Um, and so, Chris, if I come back to you, maybe you can you can talk a little bit about your funding your funding journey because you know for people that are listening or will watch this later, your funding in the fintech world is always probably one of the one of the key concerns. But maybe you can just walk us through your funding journey. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the slides that you've put up um, make good sense because I think a lot of money was backing quite early stage fintechs, maybe you know five or eight years ago, particularly in other markets. But now. You know, in each category, there tends to be some big players that have been the winners or at least the leaders in those areas. And, you know, whether it's the Robin Hoods in the US or, or other leaders, they're now able to attract enormous rounds of, of billions of dollars. Um, but it makes it more difficult to be funding sort of smaller players or, or maybe those smaller players are in niche areas. Um, I mean, our funding journey, you know, it started back in 2013. And, and I would say back then, fintech wasn't even a word in Australia. So that gives some context of, um, you know, the environment we were starting to um, start our business in. So, um, you know, from my perspective, it was quite difficult to fundraise in the early years because no one really saw the wave of growth that was going to come. And, and we, you know, it was a hard story to sell because there weren't really the runs on the board here in Australia. You know, historically, you know, in, in the, that 2010s or early 2010s, you know, venture funding didn't really exist to, much, to the same extent as it does today. And venture funds up until that point hadn't really had good success in Australia over the 20 years prior. So there was a, a bit of uh, reluctance to, to put uh, venture funding to work. Um, so we found in our early funding round, so we raised a small round in, in 2014 and again in 2015. Um, we ended up getting a lot of industry players um, putting in private capital and, and these were people that had worked in asset management or wealth management. They understood what we were doing. You know, they were passionate about um, what we were trying to achieve for consumers. You know, they, you know, they could understand our vision, um, but it was a lot more difficult to get any sort of institutional or venture, uh, venture funding back then. Um, and, and things like equity crown funding, which I see lots of fintechs using these days to access capital just weren't available. Um, yeah, having a look now, I mean, I, I think funding definitely isn't an issue, at least relatively to when we were raising capital. You know, the amount of early stage companies I see now getting funded for two, three, five million dollars, you know, is much, much larger. And, you know, often those um, businesses have a lot less traction than we did when we raised two, three, five million dollars. So I, I think funding is easier, I'd say, across the whole spectrum in Australia because the capital is now there. You know, we've got a lot of big VCs with hundreds of millions of dollars to deploy. You know, a lot of private capital that's made money in mining or in technology or in financial services where they're looking to deploy it. There's overseas capital. Um, so I think for the right ideas, money isn't the problem now. Um, I think finding useful ways to spend the money is a problem because in a lot of fintech, what's been proven in other markets is just spending um, top of funnel on advertising isn't very effective in building like a long-term business. You know, it, it can give you a bit of a sugar hit, but there's high acquisition costs when you're competing against other players in that area. Um, and, and so, you know, really the most effective place to spend money raised is in building a moat around your product. And, and that's, you know, that's why there's a big shortage of talent now, I'd say, in Australia, is there's a lot of demand for great engineers and great, you know, product managers and product designers, because that's, you know, that's really what differentiates fintechs. 
So it's, it's kind of interesting because you alluded to 2013 back in, if you can remember back to 2013 in terms of when stocks bought, you know, you know, you're one of the earliest well tech techs in Australia. And, you know, now you look back and there's a lot of conversation about unbundling and of, you know, the value chain, et cetera. But, but I guess if you just, what were you thinking when you first started the company back in, in 2013 in terms of, did, did, are you where you thought the market would be, you know, as we fast forward eight years? I, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I, I used, my, my old profession I loved as well. I, I used to trade trade markets, and and so it was a tough thing to do to step out of a, a career that y you had a, a decent salary and good job security into essentially having no salary and no certainty in an area where no one really saw the vision and, and there wasn't many runs on the board. So I mean, it was a, a big personal risk and career risk, I suppose. But I was very passionate about the opportunity, and I saw a big a, a set of trends converging around you know consumer adoption of technology around um, the adoption of indexing over active management. Um, and I saw some early signs that FinTech was going to be a big area of, of um, future growth um, in North America at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, it was certainly a, a difficult decision to make in those in that early time. And I had a lot of people, you know, looking at me like I was crazy. Whereas these days, you know, if you, if you leave your uh, banking job to start a, a fintech or any sort of technology business, you, you kind of applaud it and everyone kind of gets it and, and everyone thinks it. Is, is that, you know, it took us a while to build the track record and the trust and, and momentum in the in the product adoption. And that probably happened in line with the general adoption into other fintechs, as well as the adoption of things like ETFs in Australia. So yeah, sometimes it's a bit painful being early onto a trend. Um, yeah, and, and, and we were probably a couple of years ahead of, um, you know, uh, everyone else's sort of thinking on it. Yeah, well, well done. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, uh... I think you're right. I think there, there's now when a lot of our junior staff decide they're going to go work for a fintech, that, that's sort of commonplace in terms of, you know, leaving professions to go do that. But, you know, um, so it's a great story, obviously. And, and, you know, it's those early, early leaders in the market, you know, really kind of sort of pays off. So uh, well done to you and your company. Um, Maybe you can just explain a little bit more about the technology that you use, you know, because when people hear kind of robo advice, and, and, and how do you think that that's sort of shaping the advice that that, that you are giving? Um, sure. So, I mean, for people that don't know what we do, um, Stockspot's a website that, that Australian consumers come to. Um, they answer a few questions about their personal circumstances, you know, their their capacity to take risk, how long they're looking to invest for, you know, whether they need cash flow and dividends, and using those answers. We determine should they be investing at all or should they be doing something different like paying down debt and if they should be investing what's the best strategy for them based on the evidence of um, you know risk and reward in markets so we we build them a portfolio of low-cost funds which is you know academically and empirically proven to be the smartest way to invest and then we manage that for them so we we take away a lot of the hassles of having to pick the right investments you know, work out the right allocations, manage those allocations, rebalance them over time, do the tax reporting. Um, you know, we see ourselves as a as a expert in a very um, specific area um, that that adds value in helping build people's wealth, um, but also takes um, a lot of the effort and time away from it. Um, in in terms of the technology, so when I started the business, um, you know, as, as we sort of discussed earlier, there was already a lot of platform businesses out there like the hubs and netwells. And, and I spent a bit of time thinking, you know, could we piggyback off their technology and essentially use that? And what I realized was a lot of that tech had been built for advisors and, and it was B2B2C to to technology rather than direct to consumer technology. So we made the decision pretty early on to build everything from the ground up. Um, so we had to build our, our onboarding processes. And at the time we were, I think it's commonplace now and, and, you know, people would be very shocked if any sort of financial service you had to print off a form and sign. but we were, as far as I was aware, the first investment product in Australia that had a completely digital sign-up process. You didn't need to print off a form and sign. And it, it doesn't sound great, groundbreaking today, but yeah, I mean, I, I can assure you when I was speaking to all the vendors and service providers back then, it, it, 
it was a lot of tough conversations to get them to get them to come around to that. And there were a lot of players I talked to and they said, oh, absolutely not. There's no way we could possibly allow someone to join a, an investment product without signing their name and sending a form in. So, you know, we had to, we had, to, had a few challenges back then that we, we had to face in order to reduce the friction. And, and we thought that was something that was really important. We needed a really seamless um, experience for clients, um, you know, signing up and joining. Um, we actually provide personal advice to each client as well, which I think a lot of people don't understand. We're regulated as a personal financial advisor. So, you know, different investing platforms out there, they're, they're more self-service and, and the end user has to pick what they want to do. We actually have an obligation to give clients the strategy that's right for them and, and um, we, we review and update that advice annually. So we had regulatory hurdles we had to overcome because I had to go and spend a lot of time with the regulator to explain to them why an automated you know, website could be providing suitable advice to retail consumers and, and how we could get that right. Um, and then we had to build everything else that, you know, the onboarding processes, the portfolio management tools, you know, rebalancing and risk management, all the way through to how that looks in the in the dash um, dashboard and, and web apps. Um, and then on the back end, doing administration and tax reporting, which is quite complex as well. So, um, yeah, we took the approach of trying to um, and in not all cases did we build it initially. Sometimes we partnered with others to get our first version up and running. But ultimately, we wanted to really control the experience that customers have because you know our view was having an awesome customer experience was what was going to differentiate our, our service. And probably the final point I'd make is we we operate in in a different world to traditional financial advice, where you go to an advisor and you get a holistic sort of plan, and, and that might cover your structuring and your estate planning and insurance. We basically say to customers, look, we only provide advice in one very specific area, which is investing. So if you want to talk to someone about your estate planning or your insurances, that's not us. You need to go to a different advisor or a different service provider. And so what we're providing is actually uh, scoped advice un under under the rules in Australia. And, you know, that's, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, the big changes in the industry around wealth management is that it's becoming a lot more compartmentalized. You know, what I one of the early realizations I had is most consumers don't want to get a full financial plan, you know, usually because the cost of it's very high and, and the benefit or the perceived benefit isn't doesn't um, outweigh the costs. Whereas there are pieces of advice that people, um, you know, are interested in at the right time in their life. Um, and so it might be one, you know, at, at the right time, someone does want life insurance advice or at, at one time in their life, they do want investment advice, but they may not want it all together at the same time. And I think that's something that FinTech's now doing in Australia is working out how it can provide consumers with relevant advice at the right time. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling to myself because I'm flashing back to Buffalo 1991. Finished school, one of my friends became a financial planner and he wanted to come over and walk me through a retirement plan. I just started my first job. So to your point, you're probably not really focused on 40 years later what, what you're going to be doing. So I think it's, you know, obviously that, that targeted. And I think you're starting to see that across the fintech landscape. I think the ones that are doing ex extremely well are very targeted on one or two points. You know, and I think we'll talk a little bit, James, on, you know, the financial advisors, you know, it's a, it's a lot more difficult and, and, and it's a lot harder to, com to comply with everything because of all the different rules and regulations. So. Um, and that's one of the fallouts of, of probably the Royal Commission. But I wanted to get your thoughts, James, first in terms of, you know, there's been a, a shift with wealth management. You know, you know, Chris was a front runner in terms of digital and, and it's direct. Um, and what have you been seeing? You kind of alluded to uh, in some of your earlier comments about some of the bigger banks getting out of the financial space. Do you think they're doing that because it's pertaining to Royal Commission, or do you believe that there's there's something else in terms of you know the technology that they're that they can't compete? Oh, I think there's a I think there's a range of range of factors. I mean, obviously the Royal Commission not only brought financial services more to the front of mind than than it had been before, but it also brought into the spotlight uh, issues around ethical behaviour and conduct and and accountability uh, and Probably the the big the big banks are, are very very spread across multiple different channels and doing trying to be very good at lots of different things and and if you try to be very good at lots of different things that obviously leaves you open to to, to errors in in certain areas and so I think there's there's definitely been a a bit of a, a bit of a look at that and and a view that well we probably 
we probably need to be a specialist in certain areas and focus on what our traditional core areas are rather than rather than really deal with the the vertical integration and the and the wealth management channels for example so so there's definitely been a a, a movement there uh i mean there's the technology and and large players having having significant legacy platforms and and all very old technology it costs a lot of money to to adapt and shift and, and improve the the technology platforms that are in place uh and and there's probably been a realization that they need to be more adaptable with regards to operating models and you can't you can't do that across across multiple areas so so it's, it's there has been greater investment in in technology and in those areas with regards to the bigger players but there's also been a an agreement and an acceptance that that perhaps they need to to get out and look into different areas and so chris i guess are you starting to see sort of big tech come into this come into this space and i guess or any non-traditional non-traditional players coming into that the world tech world tech space uh maybe I, I can just add one point to um to james the last point is is that yeah particularly in our area um it's really pertinent the the conflicts in advice because you know what i saw in starting the business was a lot of the financial advice people were getting on investing because it came from one of five organizations in australia um, who controlled both the advisors and the products, they were basically just pushing products on people. And in almost all cases, you could show that those products weren't in the best interest of the end, end user. And that always was very sad to me that people weren't being educated about the best thing to invest in because they were being sold products rather than advised. So I think it's a great thing that now there's a going to be more of a separation between advice and products. So the advisors can add a, a, really act as fiduciaries to the clients and, and pick the, the right products and fintechs helping to facilitate that. Um, in terms of big tech, um, Tim, I, I think we're probably seeing a lot more in other areas of fintech like payments and lending, um, you know, ob obviously, you know, like th things like the acquisition of Afterpay show that, you know, that there's a, you know, interest in other big tech players, um, you know, buying pieces of, of the fintech ecosystem. Um, you know, payments is one that makes a lot of sense for like a Google or Apple to be participating in. Uh, wealth management is a little trickier um, because they've got a, you know they don't their brands you know may or may not um you know be able to be malleable across onto that area they're not really known for wealth management um you know often i think big tech will, will need to partner with um, a business that is known for it and maybe it's a big us global investment bank or something like that in order to you know kind of have a merging of brands and, and we know the consumer trust um, because i think wealth management isn't just like as simple as transferring money to someone, you know, it really requires a lot of trust and track record and reputation for consumers to hand over, you know, thousands of dollars or if not hundreds or, or millions of dollars of money for someone to manage. Um, where we're seeing big tech really participate more in wealth at the moment is in Asia. So um, some of these super apps in, in China and in Southeast Asia, like the you know the Ali products and the Wee products and and the Grabs, they're starting to really expand into wealth management and often um, offer you know trading or crypto or robo advice alongside their payments and other products. And so I, I you know that's where I'm starting to see glimpses of big tech wanting to participate in this area. And you know I think Grab is a good example where I, I believe they bought a robo advisor that they've now integrated into their platform. Um, and I do think it makes long-term sense. Like, I, you know, I see, you know, it, you know, it being a great opportunity, for instance, for an afterpay or, or that sort of business or a zip in Australia, you know, they're speaking to thousands and thousands of merchants. And those merchants are, are small businesses that are saving up money. And there was a great, there is a great opportunity for, um, you know, payments providers or people that already have a, a relationship with those merchants to provide other financial services. And I think that's probably the big threat to banks in Australia as well, is that once you, you know, have a product that's adored and loved in one part of the ecosystem, and, and whether that's payments or our business, um, there is a big opportunity to open up other opportunities to serve those clients in other areas and, and ultimately take market share off, off the big incumbents. And that may happen from, um, from fintechs building their own products, but I actually think the more likely scenario is fintechs work together to share customers and um, you know, and, and kind of merge their services. So the reaggregation will happen between fintechs potentially, rather than you know always fintechs being bought by the majors. 
I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch out for. And I think, you know, with, um, you know, with open banking coming into Australia, it gives that, that ability for a band of fintechs to cross collaborate across different types of fintech services. So it'd be interesting to see. You know, I also don't think the incumbents will go quietly because they've got deep pockets and, and you can see that they are, I think, I guess they're probably struggling a little bit to get to the forefront of what's next from a fintech perspective, because it seems as if they've been partnering once a fintech is established, you know, the way around the, you know, the buy now, pay later sort of segment. So, and I think you're also seeing, as James, you kind of alluded to is, you know, as banks shed parts of their business, you know, you know, we've probably seen this before. I'm the oldest one here, so I can probably say this. You, you see things, people come back to it again, because, you know, I can't, I can't imagine just a bank becoming the stock standard utility. Um, you know, I think that they will have, you know, they've got such a, a long legacy, you know, across, um, across the established countries. So it's going to be interesting to see how they, what role they kind of play. They probably aren't going to have it the way that they've always had it, where they've just basically been able to control the playing field, which I think is probably the exciting part with big tech and obviously the emergence of fintech. Um, so we talked a little bit about the Royal Commission, and I know you both have talked a little bit about this, but I think in terms of there's an element of trust, which sort of came up, you know, one of the issues of trust, and Chris, you kind of alluded to it in terms of people pushing products that, you know, weren't best for, for the customer. I guess if you look at, if you take, if you unpeel that a little bit in terms of what you've done to make sure that you're building trust with your with your customers. Maybe you could just give us a little bit about what you focus on to make sure that that happens. Well, I think, I mean, it's a challenge for any new business is to build trust with your audience or your potential customers. I think it's an even, uh, it's even more difficult for a business that's asking for someone to hand over money and, and wealth tech fits into that category. I mean, the way that we've approached it is by, um, you know, being very transparent and genuine about what we're offering. Um, you know, shedding a light on areas of the industry that we actually think, you know, are, are not, uh, you know, helping consumers, you know, do the right thing. Um, you know, gradually building our actual track record of performance, because that's something that consumers put a lot of weight on is, you know, how, what does your actual performance look like? How does it stack up in good markets and bad markets? Are you doing, you know, what you say you're doing? Um, and so, yeah, the, the brand and track record is a part of it. You know, something I did also early on in our business was that in, in in Australia, there's been unfortunately a lot of um, you know blowups in in financial services where client assets have been mixed up with others, or you know there's been issues around custody and ownership. And so you know I, I tried to use technology as a way of giving people access to um, a direct ownership model around investments, like they would with a stockbroker, um, to give them that extra assurity. Because when you are a startup, it's hard to build that sort of trust. Um, you know that that money is going to be managed safely. So if you can say, look, you don't even need to trust us because all of your money is always beneficially and legally owned by you anyway, um, then you know that that goes part of the way as well. Um, so yeah, I think there's a few areas we've you know we, we've focused on, um, and and consistency I think is key. So you know as a business we've been very consistent in our message around what's the right investment strategy. You know what's going on in the industry. You know we don't um, we don't change our product or our our messaging based on whatever's the whatever's in vogue. You know we, we're very much about low cost, long term investing, and we stick to that. And and I think that that's you know for any business being consistent in what you offer your customers is 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 what builds trust. You know whether it's your McDonald's or a wealth manager. I I think society I think society is much more open to change now than than it was as well. Uh, it's not a, it's not a set and forget in in any form of financial services now. You don't stay with the same insurer for your whole life. You 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 don't even stay with your same mobile phone the, the whole time. You look and you you look for what the better deals are. And and consumers are are now more likely to think twice than they used to do in the past. They won't just go down the obvious route and won't just go down the the traditional models. They're more open and more flexible to to thinking differently and trying new things and, and that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I think the stickiness of customers, I think gone are the days of you open a bank account and you use that bank for 40, 50, you know, sort of 60 years. I think, so you're starting to sort of sort of see that and obviously the bigger players have to be responsive of that. Yeah, I think the trust piece is obviously quite important. I mean, James, you might be able to, you know, add a comment in terms of, 
you know, in the superannuation space, you know, what what have you seen as some of the the impacts of Royal Commission, and 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 what it, what are some of your clients starting to do to try to build back up, I guess, trust in that space? Well, I think the I think probably the main thing, the main change from the Royal Commission is that entities have suddenly had to realise that the the customer has to be at the centre, and so so there's been a fundamental change internally as to as to who the the end beneficiary is and and what needs to be done to to make them happy so you're seeing a lot more focus on on the internalization of services and trying to take back control of of the relationship with the with the member and the customer uh i don't actually think the royal commission has necessarily improved customer engagement certainly certainly not in the in the superannuation space engagement remains a a continual battle and a continual fight and and hence the all the new regulation that's coming in the regulation is coming in primarily because people aren't as engaged as they probably could be with their with their finances and that's where that's where the new technology comes in and that's where the the aiming for the more personalized service comes in organizations are now having to look at whatever ways they can do to to try and reach out to the member and to to get the member to to initiate contact rather than rather than just sit back and wait for a life event to happen. Yeah, and I guess Chris, I guess from a, from your perspective, how are you dealing with the regulatory hurdles that, that keep being raised, and, and and how do you stay ahead of that? Well, we had to do a lot of work initially from a regulatory perspective because there there wasn't really anything that covered what we were planning to offer. I mean, most most of the regulation, although it was agnostic as to whether advice was provided um, by phone or, or digitally or by a person, um, you know, it, it wasn't sort of written in a way that was, you know, kind of thinking that there, there would be automated advice provided. So, you know, we had to spend a lot of time explaining our business model to the regulator in the early years, you know, why it was something that was ultimately good for consumers, it was going to open up access to advice to more people, you know, reduce costs, improve transparency. You know, a lot of the things that the regulator was trying to do and ultimately came out as things that needed to be done after the Royal Commission, we, we were solving. So, um, yeah, regulatory-wise, yeah, a lot of our work was done in the early years and now it's just about continuing to, you know, Im improve on our systems and, and ensure that we're compliant with all the rules. Yeah, ultimately, I think if you're doing the right thing by the customer, you know, it makes it a lot easier for you in the long run because, you know, you're not going to have issues like, you know, some of the majors have had now around, you know, charging dead customers or, you know, charging for advice that wasn't provided. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I think consumers have lost a lot of trust because of, of that. But really, technology helps with compliance around regulation because there's an audit trail for everything. I mean, and this was one of our points to the regulator is that, you know, we're not relying on scraps of paper that we're going to have to dig up from the office around when some advisor called up someone and got instructions to sell BHP. Everything that we're doing for clients is uh, is automated and there's a record of, of what's going on. And, and so there's a much better order trail. Yeah, I think some of that, that early work obviously has really helped for the rest of the fintech community as things have moved more, you know, more digital. So I think that... Um, you know, I think your work with the consultative, consultative group's been fantastic with ASIC, and um, hopefully you'll keep that up and uh, you know, help the rest of the, the FinTech community. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. I'm just mindful that we've got 15 minutes. Um, I, I warned the two of you that we might run out of time. Um, just in terms of COVID, uh, the perfect storm for disruption. James, from your perspective, you know, what have you seen COVID do in terms of hastening uh, the growth of digital technology, in particular within the asset management space? Uh, I don't know if it's it's hastened the development of of technology, but I think it's certainly it's certainly hastened the the level of of market participation uh, in technology ventures and and the take up. I mean, I think if you talk about the perfect storm everyone's been locked down for a long amount of time so there's an increased amount of downtime society in general is is more more tech savvy uh social media there's there's really strong advertising and marketing marketing campaign campaigns for the new entrants but there's also a lot more success stories being advertised of individuals on on social media you can always see how people are making money and how they're doing it these days uh things like the early release scheme and the fact that people are at home tends to mean, in some instances, there's a lot more disposable cash. Uh, 
And when you've got markets performing as, as strongly as they are, and underpinned by everything we've talked about with the Royal Commission and the, the level of trust in society, I mean, it's really, it's really created that perfect storm and it probably increased people's desires to, to manage their own financial future and to, to look at alternatives. So, so I think the, the development of digital technology was already there, but I think the take up has, has grown significantly. And Chris, have you seen, I guess during COVID, a significant increase in the number of uh, first-time users on your platform? Uh, yeah, I mean, over the last year, we've seen a pretty strong growth. I mean, stronger than the year before. And and yeah, I think some of those trends that James has mentioned are absolutely right. Uh, um, you know, definitely people having a bit more time to think about their finances, I think, would be one factor. I think probably the strongest factors would be um, that the people that do have maintained their jobs are actually saving up more. They're being a little bit more cautious. They're obviously not spending on holidays or other entertainment. And so um, there is a pool of savings that's getting built up. And, and that savings, um, you know, potentially in the past went into high interest bank accounts, um, but those high interest bank accounts no longer pay high interest. And the benefit you get from putting in a mortgage offset account is also not much of a benefit. So I think it's pushing Aussies to do what, you know, people in other markets like the US have had to do for the last 10 years, which is look for a better return than cash in the bank. And, you know, I think you know, low interest rates is probably underestimated as as one of the drivers for people to be shopping around for better returns. And, and it's definitely one of the drivers we've been seeing because, you know, while there is a cohort of people that are, you know, chasing the, the latest and hottest trend in, in, in trading or investments, um, I think there's a much larger group of people that just want to get a better return than they have in the bank and they don't want to be taking a lot of risk. They want to be taking a little bit more risk then putting their money in the bank and earning up in a higher return. And I think that's really what we offer, which is you know, diversification and, and risk mitigation, but the opportunity to do better than what, what you get in the bank. So that's, I think the biggest yeah, macro factor that's been helping markets and particularly our type of product is um, you know, the interest rate environment we're in and, and the savings that people are managing to, to build up. Yeah, and I think, you know, the AFR had an article in terms of the number of Aussies sort of investing on the ASX is about 1.25 million Australians. You know, the microfinancing platforms such as like Raise, you know, are, are increasing the number of users. Um, and I think it probably fits into some of that trend that you're talking about in terms of, you know, people people really can't spend their money other, other ways, you know. So even if you've got this younger generation of millennials, they're probably at home. They're not being able to go out for five bucks. They can invest in something, uh, and and I think you're starting to see that. So it reminds me of my time in Vietnam, probably 12 years ago, because the stock market was going crazy, a bit unregulated, and and all my junior staff were basically taking all the money they're making and investing it in the in the in the stock market. Probably a bit risky in retrospect, but you're starting to see people are starting to take a bit more calculated risk just because they're getting no returns anywhere anywhere else. And um, I think that trend will probably continue. Obviously, we have to see what happens with COVID-19 in terms of when we when we can come out of this and get back to a bit more life life as normal. Um, you know, and that, that links a little bit about some of the millennial investors. I guess, Chris, how, how do you deal with the, with the millennial inv investor? I guess, you know, if you look at some of the things that have been coming out, ESG, um, you know, you know some, some funds have specific things focused on that. Are you starting to see um, well, tech providers having to to uh, cater to some of these demands that are coming through from from the millennials, and I guess what are you doing from from that perspective? I mean, I, th I think millennials are, are often looking for just something that's easy and convenient, and, and so you know the customer experience is really important, especially the digital experience, and you know it's, it's driven the growth of some of those micro savings apps as well as our our type of product, even though our client demographics are a little bit different. Um, you know, what, what are the trends they're looking for? I mean, it, it does differ a little bit based on, you know, the sort of subgroups. There are a group that want to be more active in their investing and, and there are trading platforms out there that support that. Um, there are a group that want to be less active and, and just want a safe return and, and that's what our um, product offers. And then within that, there, there are people that want to invest, um, you know, in a way that aligns with their values. So we offer now sustainable or ESG portfolios and we definitely see a lot more take up of that um, style of investing for younger investors um, than than older investors, and and probably even more interest, I would say, you know, in a general sense, from females, for instance, versus males. So I think 
um, what we're seeing now is technology is allowing people to really invest in a way that um, suits them. You know, and it may be that they want to be more active and, and trading more. It may be that they don't. It may be what they want certain thematics that they want in their portfolio, whether it's you know technology or um, you know electric vehicles. And and technology is making it very easy to basically drag and drop um, you know different types of thematics and ideas into your portfolio. And and it's probably one of the shifts that's happening is that um, in the past, I guess a lot of that was embodied in in, in picking stocks, whereas these days you can you know buy one ETF and get exposure to 50 companies that have you know uh, electric vehicle and and you know battery technology exposure and, and so it's pretty easy these days to you know to build a, a well diversified portfolio um do it in a convenient way have all the tax side managed and made really easy for you and i think yeah that's pretty appealing for millennials because they um yeah it, it, it's all you know in the palm of their hand and able to be done you know pretty simply yeah, and I think it's going to be interesting, you know, obviously with the the planned wealth transfer that's going to be happening, you know, globally, you know, as, um, you know, you look at the U.S., the baby boomers eventually are going to have to hand over their money to their children, like myself. Um, you know, there's going to be a big transfer. I mean, what what sort of trends do you think are going to be coming from a wealth tech perspective when when money is shifting hands and there's going to be a different type of investor, you know, coming to the market? I mean, we're certainly seeing the starting phases of that, Tim, in, in that we're seeing more um, clients that are, you know, pretty young that are, are, are receiving inheritances or that they're, they're receiving money from their parents and looking to invest it. But in a lot of cases, they don't want to invest it the way that they, their parents invested it. They, they, you know, they may not have that relationship with the advisor that their parents had, and they may not want to see an advisor, and so they're they're looking for other ways to manage that that wealth that they've, they've built or they've inherited. Um, so. You know, it's something we see more and more in our platform is is kids and their parents sort of working together on strategies or, you know, working on that um, sort of family planning and family legacy side. Um, and, and I think it, it scares a lot of the big asset managers because what they're seeing is, you know, if, if your average client's in their 60s or 70s, you know, you're seeing your funds under management shrink every year just based on drawdowns. Um, and unless that's getting replaced somewhere, you, your, your business is basically in decline. You know, on the, on the other hand, our our business is growing by you know 50% plus each year just from people adding to their accounts you know without any new customers at all and and so we're kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum the money's coming from one group to another group and, and the younger group are, are earning bigger salaries they're saving up more they're all also receiving big inheritances and that's only going to increase over the next 20 years um, the way that that next group is going to invest is not going to look anything like I think what their parents um, did and, and that's um, you know that's an existential risk for the traditional asset managers and wealth managers because unless they defend against that outflow you know it's inevitable that their businesses are going to shrink over the next 20 years yeah that's a good point i guess in terms of you know and, and how do you see the bigger players adapting to that that particular risk because you know i think you're, you're right if, if they don't do anything eight to ten to twelve years from now they're not going to have any assets you know kind of under mass management so do you think they're going to be looking to collaborate with fintechs to, to assist with that? Or do you think that there's going to be consolidation with some of the traditional sort of asset management companies? I mean, I think that the strategies probably vary a fair bit. And I mean, it reminds me a little bit of uh, um, one of the industries I used to um, trade back in, in my previous world was um, retail. And I remember back when I was trading them in, in the 2010s, you know, businesses like David Jones and uh, Maya coming out saying that, you know, you know, internet retail was a bit of a fad and, and they didn't need to think about global pricing and ultimately people still wanted that that store experience and they were just totally wrong like they, they put their heads in the sand they ignored the big trends um, they didn't really have a proper digital strategy and their businesses you know that, that were the front runners and the leaders in Australia you know uh, uh, you know in most cases smaller than the Kogans and the upstarts that cr were created around that start so you know, I think you'll get a, a divergence. You'll get some players that you know stubbornly think that their their business models, you know, you know, will continue, and that 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 digital is just a fad, and that money will come back. Um, there's others that will partner. Um, there's others that will build. There's others that will buy. Um, yeah, J.P. Morgan was a good example. They bought in the UK recently. You know, there's others that have tried. You know, some successfully, some not to to build internally um, capabilities to to do this. Um, yeah, I think one of the challenges 
they they have a lot of the incumbents is that in, in building products you know like a robo advisor for instance they're necessarily um, you know, putting out a message around margins that competes with other parts of their business, and there are other parts of their business right now are, in, are often cash cows generating generating great cash flows, and so endorsing a lower margin product isn't really in the motivation um, for their businesses in the short run. O obviously, executives in most businesses are motivated in, in, in more short term performance, and so you know, doing something that might cut your business profits and margins for the next three years but will be better in 10 and 20 years time, you know, is not the sort of thinking a lot of big businesses do. And, and so, yeah, it, it leads to a situation that there's opportunities for fintechs. You know, that's why, you know, that there's businesses now like Robin Hood with a market cap of $50 billion. Um, it, it's because, you know, the, the, the um, brokers were the last ones to cut their margins, were the last ones to cut their fees because they were hoping desperately they wouldn't need to and then they eventually realized they had to. Yes, you know, the words digital is a fad is resonating in my head. My dad worked for Kodak 1985. He came back and told me digital is a fad, bad mistake by Kodak. The, the rest is history. So I think it's, um, you know, so I think it's, it's kind of, you know, you both talked about the, the need to be agile. You know, like, I mean, I think what, you know, even fintechs, obviously they've got to continue to be agile because even if something's working today, it's will that continue to work? Um, and so you kind of allude to Chris, you probably think there's going to be, potential opportunities for collaboration across the fintechs as well, because I think that that's, you know, if I look at individually, every fintech, you know, standing alone is a bit difficult, but if you're kind of combining some of those skills and, and uh, the thinking across different products, you know, that I think can probably test, you know, last a test of time. So hopefully that will, we'll see some of that. Um, again, we only have a couple of minutes left. So I just wanted to, um, you know, James, just in, in your space in the superannuation, are you starting to see more collaboration between fintechs and superannuation superannuation clients uh i think i think it's definitely i'm seeing seeing a lot of super funds investing and using their money in the fintech space so that's that's one thing there's certainly more money going into into private equity funds that will that will be backing uh backing fintechs uh there's there's clear collaboration going on in regards to we talked about that that regulatory burden and the compliance bar. So, so fintechs that are wanting to set up their own super funds are very much relying on on traditional models at the moment, while they while they build the numbers and build the base. But I think there's still there's still probably a, a competitive tension there, uh, and and it's hard for for collaboration in those areas because they they are they are going against each other to a to a degree. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting because, you know, again, I spent a fair amount of time in Asia. In Asia, they definitely play the long game. And so you start to see some companies that are thinking that they can outweigh someone else. And I think, you know, some of the upstart sort of companies, they're going to be thinking, how do I get market share and, and sort of get through the first couple of years? So I think, you know, the next five years are going to be quite interesting to watch in this, this particular space. And, and, you know, in terms of sort of final questions, I, I guess, Chris, you know, you started the company in 2013. Here we are eight years later. What, what do you think, if, if I'm talking to you in five years' time, what do you think Stockspot will be and, and how do you think the wealth tech se sector will be doing here in Australia? Uh, I mean, yeah, good question. I mean, I think the reason I started the business was because I, I my vision was that there's right now and over the next 10 and 20 years a generational change in, in you know, fintech, but more specifically wealth tech and how money and assets will be managed you know, because of the adoption of technology, because of the shift into index investing and a few other trends, you know, that that's now starting to play out. You know, index investing, um, at least via ETFs in Australia, was a $10 billion business when I started Stockspot. Now it's a $150 billion business, um, but that's still a drop in the ocean compared to where it could be and, and where I think it will be. So I think, I mean, a lot of the current trends, you know, are likely to continue. Um, yeah, it's great that there's a whole new breed of new fintechs. You mentioned how many are in stone and chalk. So it's great to see a healthy ecosystem now where um, different players are able to get funding. And then, yeah, based on the merits and, and the success of the businesses, some will some will float to the surface, some will succeed, you know, some will disappear, but that's, you know, that's kind of natural. Um, but we're in like a state of flux at the moment. It's very hard to predict exactly how it will turn out. Um, but generally these periods of flux you know last 10 or 20 years and then there's a longer period of stability after that so you know i think there's a period of great opportunity now but 
those opportunities will, will, will disappear and, and you know, we'll, we'll be in a more stable world probably in five years' time, you know, where there'll be a few, you know, large successful players that have, you know, provided an awesome new product or service that have grown to a large amount of market share, you know, taken a lot of that from the incumbents and then um, that, that trend will then sort of, you know, be the norm for the next, you know, 30 years. Yes, we already hear Chris is promising stability for 30 years once we get through COVID-19. So hopefully that will be the case. And I think um, relative stability. <laughs> yeah, relative stability. So um, uh, again, uh, this brings us to the end of our discussion. You know, thanks, Chris and James, for your your valued insights. Um, hopefully, everyone who's listening thought that that was a, a great session. Um, you'll see on your screen now the next details of our next webinars. We've got a great lineup for the rest of the year. Uh, next next month we're, we're changing things up a little bit we're just going to have um we're going to talk with three fintechs um we're going to hear about the journeys of spends funds flyer in the global fintech blackhawk network so the details of the webinar will be shared with you in the follow-up email from today's session if you missed any of our previous webinars my team are adding the links so you can catch up and finally before we close the session if you can fill out a short survey so we can look to improve future webinars that would be fantastic and have a great day. Happy Friday. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.